Good evening, Mr. Petcar. And first question is, what are the biggest challenges Tatar Motors face in meeting the upcoming emission legislation? Yeah, so let me just go back a uh, few years. Uh, the upcoming regulation, of course, is the BS6. The implementation date is from 1st of April 2020. But the notification for the BS6 got issued somewhere around September 2016. And uh, so the large part of the BS6 is now behind us. Uh, of course, when we started to work uh, in those times, 2016-2017, we had to go through a number of uh, challenges. We had to look at the rationalization of the powertrain. We had to look at the rationalization of the entire vehicle portfolio. We had to look at and make the right choice of a technology. We had to look at the cost structure. We had to look at the skill set, the capability that is required in-house. And therefore, how to achieve that uh, in a manner that you have a very robust technology. You also have something which is going to be affordable and is something which is going to deliver the value to the customer when the transition happens. And therefore, a large part of the work now is done, what we began uh, in 2016. But as we stand today, what are the challenges? I am not saying that all the challenges related to the BS6 are over. There are new challenges in terms of how do we do the ramp down of the BS4 and the ramp up for the BS6 products. Then how do we look at the plan to make sure that at a given point of time, because it's, it's all a digital transition which is going to happen overnight from 31st of March 2020 to 1st of April 2020. So therefore, how do we ensure that there are vehicles which are available at every dealership? Then to ensure that there are the spare parts which are available, how do we ensure that the manpower at the network, which is the dealers in the workshops, is fully trained to uh, to handle uh, if anything that that happens as far as the BS6 vehicles are concerned. So these are the new set of the challenges uh, which currently that we are working on. Uh, the simultaneous implementation across all our manufacturing plants and we have seven manufacturing plants. So how do we do that kind of a transition with the entire supply chain with the zero obsolescence as far as the the current BS4 parts are concerned is something that we are currently working on, beside getting ready as far as the field situation is concerned. Will uh, such large changes as envisaged in uh, BS6 mean the introduction of new engine designs and could you share key IC engine technology developments? So there is a common misnomer that when you have uh, uh, the transition to BS6, it's going to be like uh, the large play in the after treatment area. But we decided, uh, you know, to not just focus on the after treatment, but also on the base engine and the base engine technologies. Because uh, we know that uh, when you move from this kind of one emission norm to other emission norm, there is a possibility that you would either deteriorate the fuel economy, you would deteriorate the performance. And therefore, unless you work on the base engine and the base engine technologies, you will not be able to actually deliver that uh, extra performance uh, when you actually deliver the vehicles to the customers. So that was one key thing that we had uh, in our mind and happy to say that we have been able to work on both the base engine as well as the after treatment. Then we also look at whether we need to have all the engines which currently at the BS4 that we have in the manufacturing, are they really required to be there in the BS6? Or should we not focus on the ones which are actually the new generation engines which are known for good performance, good durability and deliver the better fuel efficiency? So we decided to shed some of the old generation engines and focus on developing the new engines, which anyway we had at the BS4, but we needed to improvise them at the base engine level at the uh, BS6. So it's a, I would say a well thought out strategy in terms of uh, not just working only in the area of the after treatment. And the lubricant certainly has played a good part in, and act, acted as a catalyst in delivering the good performance overall. What other changes do you envisage in terms of after-treatment technologies to meet the new emission regulations and what challenges do they pose? So today the baseline which is the BS4 is with the simple after-treatment technology. When you talk about the gasoline, it is a, like a three-way catalytic converter. Take the light duty diesel, it's basically with the oxidation catalyst. And if you take the commercial vehicles about three and a half tons, then either they are with the SCR or no SCR. So it's a combination of the internal engine majors or the after treatment like the SCR. Now what happens in the BS6 because of the significant drop in the, the tailpipe emission requirement and the particulate matter alone comes down to anywhere in the region of 50 to 70 percent. The NOx comes down in the region of again the 80 to 90 percent. 
and therefore this calls for a significant effort and the work to be done in the area of the after treatment and therefore we see the combination of the various technologies in the after treatment and that is something it's not like a one shoe that fits all because each vehicle has its own the duty cycle its own vehicle weight and uh, the power to weight ratio and the duty cycle so looking at the temperature profile looking at the duty cycle looking at uh, the durability expectations in that particular segment we decided to make and optimize the package as far as the after treatment is concerned which is unique to a particular given category of the vehicles and of course with a large degree of the commonization across various engines various vehicles and the modularity even within the after treatment technologies so broadly to say as far as the particulates are concerned we are focusing on use of uh, the diesel particulate filters as far as the nox is concerned we are looking at whether it can be done only with the scr or combination of the scr plus egr that's the basic approach and also if the temperature profile permits us then we also are going to use lnt which is the lean nox trap technology all these are the new technologies which will be brought in for the bs6 for the after treatment beside the conventional oxidation catalyst which will be there on the diesel in any case and all this after treatment technology they also come up with their own set of the sensors for the continuous monitoring of the performance of the after treatment technologies fuel economy norms for hdvs and pvs have been implemented and the more stringent phase 2 to kick in by april 21 2022 the light duty fuel economy norms are under development together with the implementation of barrett 6 how are tata motors placed to address these challenges when actually we approach uh, technology for the bs6 we knew that time that we anyway have to work also for the fuel economy and the some part of the uh, technology also comes in at the bs6 now which is going to be launched in 2020 is something which is going to be suitable even for the upcoming stringency in the phase 2 of the cafe norms and uh, the cafe norms for the light duty vehicles the m1 category vehicles will be implemented the next phase from april 2022 and for the commercial vehicles the vehicles which are about 12 ton truck uh, gvw vehicles where the the regulations will be coming from uh, 2020 as the uh, as the notification says Uh, so therefore there is a lot of work which is happening in the area of uh, the fuel efficiency also and there is always a nexus between the emissions and the fuel efficiency because if you need to improve both then there is a technology which comes to your rescue engine oils are known to contribute to fuel economy as a result there is a global move to lower viscosity levels what specific performance attributes do tata expect the engine oil to deliver so engine oil has a very significant role to play and if i just go back little bit in the history we as a tata motor we started to focus on exploiting the potential of the lubricants more than now it's about 12 to 13 years back when we started to develop our own formulation what we call internally as a supply specifications and every of this formulation we have a unique supply specification code and uh, this is something which we offer to all the prospective the oil marketing companies to provide the oil in accordance with the 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 supply specifications but i must also say that uh, because of the expectations coming from the consumers in terms of the better fuel economy longer drain interval and also at the same time the emission technologies which are less tolerant to some of the ingredients which are there in the lubricant therefore globally the lubricant industry uh, has been responding very well i must say and uh, therefore they also are coming up with the formulations which are suitable to comply with the expectations of both the consumer as well as the the OEM and the agencies such as uh, API or ACEA they are very quick to respond to this uh, the requirements whether it is conventional IC vehicles or in the transmission oils so there has been a good development coming from the lubricant industry specifically talking about the low viscosity oil is a trend to go for the lower viscosity simply to get the better fuel consumption in india as per the commercial vehicles are concerned the bs6 because of lot of technologies which are there plus there is the possibility of a late injection which can cause the fuel dilution and therefore we would like to be little cautious as per the commercial vehicles are concerned we may not in one go go to very ultra low viscometrics but the passenger cars there is a good possibility to go towards the low viscosity oil and that's where we are talking about migration from 10w30 going to 16w20 
and the Juro W20. So that's the path that uh, we have chosen as far as the passenger vehicles are concerned. Are there any plans to develop a global Tatar Motors engine oil specification? So we have this uh, internal supply specification, which is actually uh, is the one that we actually try to go to the global market. So we are currently operating in the South African region, Sark region, Middle East regions, Far East regions. And the first, our approach would be to take the supply specification which has been developed. And if there is a avail available oil in the local market, then we would like to actually prefer that. But depending on if that kind of a supply specification is not possible in the given market, and if there is a, some change in one of the parameters, then we would like to actually critically examine that. And if it is impacting, let us say, the oil drain interval, for example, in which case we may like to specify a lower oil drain interval. But our first approach would be to basically demand the, the supply specification what we have developed. Together with changes in emission and fuel economy legislation, fuel quality too has undergone a transformation in India. What are your thoughts on the variation in quality of available fuels in India and do you have any concerns? This concern is always there, but I must also say that the oil marketing companies uh, or the fuel supply companies, uh, they also have put in a lot of conscious efforts in the last so many years. And what are those measures that they have taken? For example, you know, there are markers in the kerosene, so you can't adulterate uh, the, the regular fuel with the kerosene. You can very easily make it out. Then they have something called as a, the tanker gate sealed when it leaves their premises. And then again, when the tanker reaches the retail outlet, there is someone who checks whether the seal is intact. And nowadays, again, they are tracked through the GPS. So any movement of these tankers en route is being monitored for any deviation in the route or unwarranted halt. So the good efforts which have been already taken as far as the oil marketing companies are concerned, but still there is a doubt. And in the light of the BS6 coming, now we have become a little more active and actually demanding the government that we should have a, uh, the fuel quality audit mechanism at the retail outlet. And uh, this is something which uh, we would be requesting government of India to consider it very seriously. And because it's all after treatment play finally, if you have the deviation in any of the fuel quality parameters, it can kill the after treatment, it can kill the emissions, it can trigger the OBD faults, and therefore it can actually create a very chaotic condition. So we are concerned and therefore we are asking for the, the audit to be done as an institutionalized process. And there should be a notification to this effect of the audit, at what periodicity, who should do the audit, what parameters to be checked. It's not enough today when they check, you know, the specific gravity of the fuel. That doesn't tell you how much is the sulfur content or what is the C10 number. So today's, yes, there are certain uh, measures taken, but are they adequate? The answer is no. We need to move much beyond that. And in the Western world, this kind of audit mechanism is already there. And therefore, this is what something we are actually now asking for. Where do you think India is headed towards in practical terms? And will these alternate technologies play a significant role in the future? These are all the upcoming technologies. And uh, our view is that uh, there is a trend towards the electrification. There is a push from the government of India. And there is a need to go for the zero emission vehicles. For the simple reason that uh, India has the two unique challenges. One is related to the ambient air quality and 14 out of the globally top 20 cities, uh, they reside in India with the very high level of pollution. And therefore, there is a, I would say, the, a great degree of urgency to do something to, to reduce the ambient air, uh, improve the ambient air quality. The second driver for that also is because India depends a lot on getting the imported crude. And therefore, as a combination of both, uh, there is a need to improve overall the, the situation in terms of the availability and broad basing of the fuel technologies and at the same time improving the, the emission profile. And while this you can keep doing it through the organic means by regular tightening of emission norms. Therefore, rightly so, one is thinking of having the push toward the electrification. There are various incentive schemes even from the government of India side to promote uh, the use of uh, electric vehicles. But in our view, both the hybrid vehicles and the electric battery operated vehicles both uh, would be uh, there and uh, I don't think that it is something like whether the only hybrids would win or the only the full electric will win. 
it's both categories that would coexist uh, in the country and it would be up to the each individual OEM what kind of a strategy they would like to have. Somebody may decide to, you know, be there only with, let us say, the battery electric vehicles. Somebody may decide to go only with the hybrid. Somebody may have the mixed model of battery and the uh, full battery vehicle as well as the hybrid vehicles. We as the Tata Motor, we are looking at all the technological options. We are not close anyone. You could have seen in my presentation that there is going to be a, a longevity to the conventional IC engine simply because the hybrids enable the IC engines to even become more clean and offer better fuel economy. I just want to say that uh, there is not going to be a single winner and therefore we are working on all categories of technological options even on the IC uh, engines we are working on petrol engines, diesel engines, CNG engines. We are looking at the blends of various fuels and also we are looking at the, uh, the full battery electric vehicles. We are also looking at the hybrid vehicles so it's all that we are actually looking at and working on these technologies. Lastly, looking ahead, what do you think will be the next big challenges that Tata Motors will have to address? Seeing only from the OEM perspective, there are these four global mega trends, what they call it as a SS, so autonomous electric connected vehicle technology and the shared mob mobility. And these are the things which are actually the ones which are dictating the sort of a future roadmap as far as the organization is concerned. I won't call them as a challenges, but I call them more as an opportunity. And uh, we have uh, uh, strategic plans to work in each of these areas. And in the coming years, you will definitely see the products which have the reflection of these SS into them. Thank you very much. Thank you.